Hey Jody here, WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. Today I'm going over the basics of hooking up a scratch start TIG to a DC stick welder. This is a Miller Thunderbolt that I picked up off Craigslist a year or two ago. It's a heavy little machine, but it's portable enough that you could easily throw it in the back of a pickup truck, take it to a job site on a hand truck, and it's used a lot on construction sites, especially uh, dairy type stuff, food service, sanitary uh, tubing and all that for scratch start TIG because it's a uh, it's pretty much bulletproof machine uh, and you can throw it in the back of a truck and then take it somewhere and weld with it and and pretty much depend it's going to work when you get there so it's really simple I'm gonna but I'm gonna go over the basics on how I would hook up a scratch start TIG and uh, basically what you see here is just about what you need bottle of gas regulator flow meter machine air cooled TIG torch with a valve on it and uh, not much more than that. I had lunch with a guy a while ago and he's gonna be working with me on some videos and he's a contractor and a lot of times he runs a portable power source like a Lincoln Ranger for the power source and TIG welds off that up on a scaffold somewhere doing pipe joints and things and he has hired students fresh out of school and have no idea how to set up scratch start. They, they learned how with a foot pedal in a booth and all that and that's that's fine but before you get on the job site, it would be good if you could know how, know the fundamentals on how to set up scratch start because you might have to do it. All right, so that's that's why I'm doing this video today and let's get to it. A couple of things. You need a machine that's got DC current in order to do scratch start TIG on steel. This one is AC DC, but that doesn't mean I can do aluminum. I would need a high frequency generator box. I've done that before. It really wasn't worthwhile, wasn't worth the effort or the expense. High frequency generator boxes are kind of pricey, and even when you get one, you really st you still don't have amperage control or anything like that. This machine comes with the leads hardwired in. Now, you could do an upgrade here by snipping them and putting DENS connectors on there where you could put longer leads on there. You could run 100 feet of lead to where you're welding and the machine could be down on the floor and you could be up on a scaffold. This is a really old CK torch. It actually says Conley and Kleppen on it. And it's pretty was pretty common back in the day. Two two cables like this, one regular welding lead, this is a number two welding lead here, and an argon hose, and that's how you got your power right there. Now I'm going to hook up a one piece, a single cable design today, but one thing you do need is you need a torch valve. These are two different style torch valves. That's the most common. This one is a sideways twist thing there, but works just fine. All right, this is a standard torch cable. It's already got a DENS connector on it, which is common to see today because that'll plug right into most TIG inverters today. But I'm going to have to take that off. And I'm just going to hook up this TIG torch really quickly here. I would put a wrench on that and snug it up before I put the handle back on. I'll do that later. And the other end, the DENS connector will have to come off. So I'll take it loose really quickly here and then put this, this power adapter on here. It's a part number 105Z57. I'll display that here in just a minute. So I'm going to roll the argon bottle over and chain it up to the table. And that's mostly, mostly the work is done now. I've got to set up my flow meter. It's always a good practice to give the valve a little crack to blow out any dust or anything that might be in there. Not 100% necessary. Mine's been inside for quite a while, so the risk of anything being in there is pretty nil. This is an inert gas hose, but this thing could be 100 feet, 200 feet long if I needed it to be. I'm hooking up the power cable adapter, getting everything snug. Now the torch valve basically takes the place of the solenoid valve that is inside most welding machines. So when you want argon, you turn it on, and when you're done, you turn it off. It is equally important to remember to turn it on as it is to turn it off. You forget to turn it on, you smoke a tungsten, you forget to turn it off, you just waste your argon. This is the power cable part number 105Z57. I, I don't know there's any difference in quality on these, so I would just go to Amazon and get the cheapest one and hook up the stinger and boom you got power. Now you gotta make sure you're on the right polarity and that is DCEN also called straight polarity on some machines. This one's just got a minus sign. Some machines it's called DCEN, some machines it's called straight polarity. You just have to know all these things because that's always how you're gonna TIG. 
I'm shooting for around 100 amps here, and this is not exactly a precision instrument here. But I did check it, and came out to be almost 104 amps, so pretty close. I'm just going to bend a piece of 1 8 wire here for, this, for the spacer. And you see I'm using some mini bolt cutters, so much easier than dykes. And your hands will thank you years down the road. I used to think it was tough to just use dykes on the 1 8 wire, and uh, now my hands hurt. So I'm just going to get some tacks on the, on the very ends here, and then I'll beef them up just a little bit after the fact. 1 8 gap, no land, 37 and a half degree bevel. All the mill scale cleaned off pretty well. You can see the, the 1 8 wire just won't push through. And that's about where you want it on a fit up on a pipe joint. Now, you're not going to do a, a plate joint like this. Typically, you're not going to do a test with TIG root and all that. This is just basically establishing techniques and settings for a pipe joint. But these same settings will work just the same. Same techniques will work just the same on pipe as they will on this plate. You saw earlier, I'm close to 104 amps. And I'm using a, just a forward and back technique here. Forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. No side to side motion. And the reason for the no side to side motion is because less of a chance of suck back. This tends to push the root through a little bit better. And just plane up works better. And if it keyholes out on me accidentally, if I'm not walking the cup, I can easily back up, fill it in, and then back up another eighth and, and then smooth things out and then keep and pick up where I left off. Walking the cup, it's kind of hard to back up. We'll walk the cup a little bit in just a minute. So I'm going to stop here halfway, snap out, and I'm going to break the wire loose. And I'm not even going to prep the tie-in because I just don't really think it's necessary when you pick up where you left off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to touch the wire to the weld, and I'm going to fuse it there really quickly, and then just pause for just probably a second. Sometimes I even try to back up a little bit, and then just go. Now, you see me flick the wire there. Some guys I've seen flick one end of the wire and then, and then flip it around like a drumstick and use the other when they're on x-ray pipe. Notice that I'm wiggling it, not moving much side to side. That says I want to concentrate that arc force in the middle to push some metal through the back side and not let it fan out to where it's lower than flush. All right, this is looking at it from kind of an angle, just so you can tell. It's pushed through just a little bit. Right there, it's fairly flat, but still pushed through. Since I didn't have any tacks, I'm going to go ahead and show the feathering technique here for a tack weld. This is how I do it. I feather the side that I'm tying into a lot more than the side that I'm starting from. In fact, a lot of times I don't feather at all on the side that I'm starting from. But this is, a, this is another plate, but I, I feather this little area right here. Let me just show you what it looks like when you tie into a feathered area. All right. In just a second, I'm going to be getting to the point where it's feathered right about there. I'm just going to keep going because sometimes it's hard to tell when you get there. But usually if you pay attention, you can see, okay, my wire is raising up a little bit. And I take it over onto the wall and then snap out. All right, another thing that's, that's done a lot with Scratch Start TIG is stainless steel sanitary tubing. And actually it's done a lot with the Miller Thunderbolt just because they're so durable. People throw them in the truck. They get rained on. They work when they get where they're going. Now, oftentimes, no filler wire is used on sanitary tubing. They don't want to introduce any oxides to the inside, and it's got to be purged really well. And so sometimes it's walking the cup, sometimes it's freehanding, but here's kind of a, a technique for freehanding, just making little small circles. That little line, because it's such a good fit up, and it needs to be a good fit up, the joint line's kind of hard to see sometimes. So just making some little movement like that kind of plays the light and helps you follow the joint. Again, it's got to be purged really well. A lot of things come into play on sanitary tubing. First off, a good clean cut, then a good fit up, then a really good purge. Now, before I wrap the video up, I want to talk about maybe a more practical application for something you might build in your shop. And the problem with scratch start TIG is not usually starting the arc. That doesn't usually cause any problems. It's stopping the arc. So a piece of copper can really, really help. I'm using a copper spoon from Harbor Freight. It's a $10 part. I put it on the edge of the part where I can take the bead all the way and all the way onto the copper, maintain some gas shielding, and before I snap out. That helps tremendously. 
Here's a practical application for that, welding an end cap on a piece of square tubing. I've just got the copper spoon laying there right next to the bead, and it actually kind of traps argon a little bit too. And when you get to the end, instead of snapping out and having it be all gray and, and losing gas coverage, just take the arc over to the copper while you maintain a little gas coverage, snap out, things go way better. Well, that about wraps it up for this week's video. Like I said before, the reason, the reason for this video is primarily for students that maybe haven't had an opportunity to, to learn scratch start. So give you a little leg up if you get thrown to the wolves. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching. I know you got a lot of choices out there on welding channels. I appreciate you spending time on my channel. See you next time.